and cut on that. Bunny! Yes. Yeah. If you're like me, you're no doubt a big fan of this podcast, The Pope on Film. I mean, who is it nowadays? It's sweeping the country. That and the coronavirus. But only true, only real fans, true hardcore fans that have been with us since the beginning would know two things about us, two fundamentally really real and in no way made up on the spot facts about the both of us, America's hottest will they or won't they, the next Sam and Diane, it's Bunny and Steve. First and foremost, the first fact, which is about you, Bunny, is that before you and I started our podcast in 2014, you actually... Um, lived in a convent for 12 years. Can you tell us a little bit about that part of your life? Yes. Uh, well, it, 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 was a, it was a rough childhood, so um, getting close to graduation, it was a big choice was of whether I go on to college or not. Uh, I no way was family paying for college, so uh, the only other two choices was a life of prostitution or becoming a nun. So I chose to become a nun instead. St. Margaret O'Hallahan, the perpetual whining. That, that, is, that is our order. Yeah, famous one. So, so we have we have uh, some sick, and I really this sacred. I really shouldn't, but fuck them. They they dick me over in a pyramid scheme, but yeah. <coughs> but you know, we we had some of our most sacred prayers uh, for Margaret o- o- O'Hallahan's. Um, Sing to the perpetual whiny, something like, Jesus, would you please make it stop? You know, that was a big one. That was a big one. And you know beautiful where? when you hear, you know, just hundreds of voices saying that in, in harmony. Like, you could really feel like you're reaching God's ear. Uh, fun fact, do you know where pyramid schemes originated? Egypt, of course. Egypt, yeah, yeah. Egypt. The first place where someone did a pyramid scheme. Someone was looking at the pyramids and it's like, I've got a ski. That's, <laughs> and that's how it came to be. And the second fact that you would know about me is that I'm a lover of history. I love it, but I'm also a storyteller. So what I like to do is I like to uh, find a story from the history books, maybe one that people don't know too well, and sort of rework it via my own unique storytelling style. And that's what this is, another educationally uneducational installment of Steve's Historic Approximations. Dun, 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 dun. I didn't do it that loud because I'm hungover. Or shap, as I like to call it, repeatedly, annoyingly, whether anyone wants me to or not. Personally, I like the name shap. It's short and it's full of life. It's the Paul Williams of podcast segments. <laughs> oh, God bless that short, short man. Who, who, who do you think would win in a fight in in their prime? Paul Williams or Danny DeVito? Uh, I, think, I think Paul Williams... First off, first off uh, you can so easily overlay the image of an in-his-prime Paul Williams with Chuck Norris from that Bruce Lee movie. I forget which Bruce Lee movie it was. It was the one where he <laughs> fought Chuck Norris. Game of Death, I think? I don't know. So, don't so know. that's... That's it. That's it for, for Paul Williams there. You know, so that's the moves he's going to make. He's, but, but Danny DeVito, you know, he's got the fucking street smarts, you know? Street smarts! You know, <laughs> Paul Williams... 
is not going to suddenly take off his belt and start beating you with it. That's not a Paul but. Williams move, but that is totally a Danny DeVito move. He will start but. hitting you with his shoe. But here's the thing. Paul Williams, in his prime, he's got that coke energy. Yeah. Yeah, you know? that's true. He just did a shit ton of coke, and he's about to lift up an entire car. <laughs> that's how much cocaine he's done, so I wouldn't rule Paul Williams out of this yeah. scenario. Say. Anywho... Today on the how, how is there is there okay okay is there a way is there out there somewhere where there's a generator where we could put in raw stats for both Danny DeVito and there's generators on the internet of all kinds Danny DeVito yeah. and Paul Williams and it would calculate the winner round by round. I always wanted to make a Street Fighter Mortal Kombat type fighting game, but use historical figures. And it's like, who are you going to be? Oh, man, I was going to pick Jesus. Fine, I guess I'll be... Uh, I guess I'll be Wilbur Ross. <laughs> you know, just get a bunch of random people fighting game. And it's just like, oh, Teddy Roosevelt versus Betty White. This is going to be a good matchup. Yes. So we could easily put that in and have uh, Danny DeVito and Paul Williams be unlockable characters. Cool. So, so yeah, we're moving forward with this idea. Anywho, today on the old Shappity Shap Shap, we will be making a movie and discussing the true story of a Russian widow and her fighting girlfriend. This is a totally unbelievable, yet really real story. It's a real good one, and I'm, I'm very excited. It's also a kind of familiar story. What it reminds me of, it reminds me of the shaft that we did about a year ago about the dread pirate Gene DeClisson. Do you remember that shaft? Yes. That was a good one. That was a shap about a French noblewoman who, once her husband was executed by the king, became a bloodthirsty pirate. It's a whole theory of a woman scorned sort of a deal. And so, yeah, this is uh, in many ways that same. Why do all of these cats try and turn off the things that I'm doing? Stop it, cats. So this week is another Fury of a Woman Scorned story. This chap is about a Russian woman named Mariah Oktyab uh, Mariah Oktyabrskaya. Sure was. Oktyabrskaya which is really hard for me to say. So from here on out, I'm just going to call her Mariah. Sure. She was one of 10 uh, children. Uh, she was born in 1905 in Crimea, which was a part of the Russian Empire. Poor Ukrainian woman. In 1925, she marries a Russian man named Ilya, and it's all good. Their marriage is good. They're both happy. Ilya is an officer in the Russian army. And so Mariah takes a bit of an interest. She's all like, hey, can I help at all? Is there anything that wives can do to help out their soldier husbands? So there's a Russian military wives council and she joins it and she gets trained as a nurse in the army. She also gets a bit of weapons training and learns how to drive a few military vehicles. But our girl Mariah isn't super into it. Mariah is all like, oh, fiddle dee dee. I won't ever need to know all of this because I'm not a soldier. I'm just here to support my amazing husband who I love and will be with forever. Okay, so some years pass and uh, the the team behind World War One, the first one, 
were so happy with the way that it turned out that they finally go forward with a sequel. This one's called World War II Electric Boogaloo. Yes. So World War II breaks out and Ilya goes to war. And as the Nazis approach, Mariah is evacuated to Siberia, which I hear is cold. Yes. So that's exciting. Or used to be. Or used to be, yeah. yeah. So she's in Siberia, and she's waiting to hear from her husband any news about her husband, and she waits in Siberia for two years. And then in 1943, she learns, because news travels real slow, that her husband died in a fight with Nazis in 1941. The news took two years to reach her in Siberia. Well, it is safe to say that our girl Mariah fucking snaps. Okay. At this point, she snaps. Now, the story of Mariah Akhtiabraskaya is usually summed up in a sentence or two. Every once in a while, you might come across a Mariah Akhtiabraskaya meme, and it'll be, and what it sounds like is, husband dies, wife buys tank. And that's a real oversimplification of things. So this is what happens. Mariah sells all of her possessions and writes Stalin personally. Okay. She gets a pen and a paper. Dear Stalin, how have you been? Did you have a nice summer? How is your wife? <laughs> Look, my husband was killed defending the motherland, and I want revenge on the fascist <laughs> duck for his death. I have deposited all of my personal savings, because remember, she sold everything this year. I have deposited all of my personal savings, 50,000 rubies, to the National Bank for the sole purpose of paying for a tank to be built. I kindly ask for two things. Number one, for the tank to be named The Fighting Girlfriend. A lot of people in the house have a hard time with this because the tank should be named the fighting wife or the fighting spouse or the fighting widow, not the fighting girlfriend. But that's just the name that Mariah picked. Maybe it just sounds better in Russian. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, I kindly ask for two things. Number one, for the tank to be named the fighting girlfriend. And number two, for me, Mariah, to be the driver of said tank. Now, uh... Two things about that letter. Number one, I found the actual letter that she wrote Stalin, and you'd be surprised uh, how much of what I said was actually in the letter. Yeah. And if this were the U.S., secondly, if this were the United States, uh, some uh, bureaucrat in the army would be like... <laughs> now see here, little missy. We can't just let anyone drive a tank, let alone a delicate female flower like yourself. So go bake something for your m man. Uh, or maybe go play some baseball. Women are allowed to do that now, but no crying. Yeah. There's no crying in baseball. But this is not cat. This is not the United States. This is Russia in the 1940s during a war. And so basically, Stalin writes back to Mariah, "Fuck yes." And just like that, our girl Mariah buys a tank and starts fighting Nazis. This is the movie. I'm imagining a Quentin Tarantino movie starring Anya Taylor-Joy from The Queen's Gambit and The Russian Mutant from The New Mutants. I'm imagining her as Mariah in my head. Yeah. Definitely pull off Russian. Yeah. <clears throat> but anyway, World War II. Russia 
Usually tank drivers get the most minimal training and are immediately rushed to the front lines because Russia is just like uh, sending people to war and having them killed just lickety split. So usually tank drivers get the absolute basic training and a rush to the front lines, but they give Mariah an intense five months training program, including not just how to operate it, but how to fix it, how to repair it, what the parts are, what the parts do, how to fix this part, what if this part breaks. She's, she becomes a tank professional here, but her fellow tank drivers are all laughing at her. This is just a publicity stunt. You're not a real tank driver. You should just give up now, little girl. Ha ha ha. You can imagine the entire scene in this yeah. movie. You can imagine the scene of her taking her intense uh, uh, five-month training session on the tanks and all of the other tank drivers looking down at her and laughing at her in the locker room or whatever the fuck. You can see the whole thing. Yeah. You can see the scene. You can see the montage. Then they start throwing tampons at her. Yeah. Yeah. You can see the montage of her like under the tank, you know, fixing it with a wrench and, I don't know, using a jack and, and um, I don't know, welding. You're the best. And her. Around. Her feet. Nothing's ever gonna keep you down. Yeah. You're the best. Around. Yeah. I, I was thinking more of a. I'd like to get to know you well from. A Better Off Dead when they're fixing the old car. Yeah. Is what I was thinking. But you can see, like, finally at the end, you know, she wipes her brow and she gets you know oil on her forehead as she finally paints the word fighting girlfriend on okay the wait, wait 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 okay wait okay there's the tank she leans up she wipes the sweat off of the brow yeah we now have them in silhouette on a cliff <sighs> in front of a beautiful sunset yeah. Her, tank? her and her tank <clears throat> in silhouette. Go ahead. Or, or we rocky, we rocky three it, and her and the tank are having a race on the beach. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's another way we can go with this, uh, and and oh hey, your your five month intense training session on the tank is done, and tomorrow you're going to the front lines, and you you can see the scene of like it's the night before the big battle. She's all nervous. She goes to see the tank, you know, puts her hand on it, maybe says some speech to herself about how this is all for my husband who I love so much. All the other yeah. tank drivers still laughing at her. Cut two. It's a big battle sequence. Smolensk in 1943. An intense battle. Explosions. People are dying left and right. And Mariah is right there in the middle of it with her tank of fighting girlfriend. She's not scared. She's not wavering. She's leading the battle. She's kicking ass. And then boom. Her tank is hit. It is dead. It's not working anymore. Her captain comes on the radio and is like, okay, Mariah, you're out of commission. Just stay in your tank and wait this battle out. But what does she do? She jumps out of the tank during a battle, heavy fire all around her, and while the battle is continuing, she fixes the goddamn tank. <laughs> Yay! Yeah. In it, keeps fighting, takes out the machine gun nests, and helps Russia win the battle against the freaking Nazis. Afterwards, like a classic movie, the captain goes, Mariah, you disobeyed a direct order during the battle. I should have you court martialed. But. You acted bravely and helped us achieve victory. You're being promoted to sergeant. Okay. Mariah spends four months in battle 
in the front lines, leading the charge in her tank, the fighting girlfriend, killing Nazis, proving herself to be a brave hero, taking part in a number of battles, and oftentimes she would do her her bit and she's driving around and she's leading the charge and the tank gets knocked out and Mariah's like I'll be back she jumps out of the tank during a battle she she does that a couple of times and in Russia the story of the fighting girlfriend becomes this legend that everyone you know loves then on January 17th 1944 during the Leningrad Novgorod offense or girl Mariah does the jump out and fix the tank bit for the last time. She is hit in the head with a shell fragment and stays in a coma for two months before dying on March 15, 1944. She was buried with full military honors and was posthumously made an official hero of the Soviet Union, which was the highest distinction that someone could get in the Russian army. Before she died, she wrote a letter to one of her sisters, and here is a quote from the letter, quote, I have had my baptism by fire. I have beaten the bastards. Sometimes I'm so angry, I can't even breathe. And if Disney or Pixar had any balls, this would be an amazing movie. I yes. can see an animated film. This is, this is, this is, this is... Oh, this would be a rugged Disney princess movie. Yeah. A Disney princess that loves two things. Number one, singing, and number two, killing Nazis. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I say if Disney and or Pixar had balls, they would make this into a, a Disney princess film. Uh, someone has... I'd like to uh, give you a, a website address, rejectedprincesses.com. It is run by a former DreamWorks animator named Jason Perath. Once a week, he will tell the story of a, a real life woman who was brave and fought against the odds and has an amazing life story that Disney should m make into a Disney princess, but they won't because they don't have the balls. And so once a week, he picks a different story. And I was looking up the story of Mariah Octia Briskaya, and sure enough, he has a great, uh, I was thinking of buying a sticker or maybe a poster for, for Mariah's rejected princess and it's her in like full mil military gear and then the tank is alive in the drawing that he does for Mariah yeah but I, this is a fascinating story of a woman whose husband was killed so she bought a tank and fought Nazis with it like good for you Mariah this is an amazing story you know and uh, I know I've said this uh, possibly a few times before on the podcast, but I'm surprised that more people don't know about this story. No. Mariah Octabraskaya. Be sure and check out rejectedprincesses.com. It's really adorable. The drawing that they have of Mariah is really cute. See, once you, once you, once you said it about being a Disney princess, then that forced the whole story that you had told up until that point to repeat in my head except for animated. Yeah. You yeah. know? Like, I am really, really seeing a jaunty cap of some sort involved here. Yeah. <laughs> jaunty cap. You know? Maybe she wears, like, one of those Biggles caps in her nice. tank or something, you know? Uh, yeah. And the tank is alive and says, ka uh, The tank being alive really kind of creeps me out there. I mean, you know, give yeah. her a puppy. Come on. No, the tank, like, <laughs> just like in Cars, the cars were alive. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, so the tank I alive. No, I understand that, out. but and then like in Transformers, but, where the come on, let's go kill a lot of people. That's yeah. not a cute, <laughs> endearing. But she's killing Disney. Nazis. <laughs> but they're Nazis. They're not people. They're Nazis. 
They're Nazis. They, so it's okay. So then I then I recommend if we're gonna go that path, then I recommend that the tank have have accents or attributes that you kind of can see Dumbo esque. Okay, with that with the long turret that fires death shells, you know. Yeah. Oh, you know what? Oh, 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 oh. You know what? Hmm. He's ramping Give up now. Give the tank a cold. A or the tank has allergies. Maybe that's when it gets, like, yeah, out yeah. of position and she has yeah. to fix it. Well, yeah. but, but it, it yeah. keeps sneezing, and it keeps sneezing, and people keep dying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm all right with that. That's a good addition. So yeah, that's that's uh, Steve's historic approximation for this week. Be sure to join us next week for more educational and educational thought. And cut on that, Bunny. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, we have to talk about this week's movie.